The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Now listen to me, Caesar. There can be only one talking chimpanzee on Earth. The child of the two talking apes. From 20 years back. From the year, Senor Amanda, when the two talking apes arrived on Earth. And we believe that the male and female talking apes have come to us out of the future. A month before the talking apes arrived on Earth. From now on, you have but one assignment, to find that talking ape. Yeah, he's a uh, performing ape uh, for my circus. A talking ape? That idiot! This chimpanzee. Get out of retraction immediately. Announce that the talking ape has been apprehended and put to death. Hello to all you chimps, gorillas, orangutans, underdwellers, kygors, and even you damn dirty humanoids. Now, before we get into this show, we just want to take a minute and ask that you please take care of yourselves out there and your loved ones in these crazy times. And we hope that we can provide some levity and take your minds off the reality of what's going on in the world. I am Richard Woloski, and I want to welcome you once again to Talking Apes. This is your Planet of the Apes podcast, where over the past six years, we have focused on the classic apes era. We also talk with authors, actors, and the fan community. Now, everyone, please say hello to my co-host, Mr. Marco Gushewitz. Hey, Mark. Hey, hey, Rich. How are you doing during this time where everything's locked down and it's just you and your wife home alone? Has it gotten to you yet? You know, we're just sitting by the big picture window out front and the first time we see an ape walk by, then I'll know that we've arrived. <laughs> I keep telling everybody with the way things are going right now that I'm just waiting for the apes to start talking. I've seen a couple of talking dogs and cats, <laughs> but I'm going to hold out until we see the apes. Then I'll know that... We were so ahead of the curve all this time. <laughs> well, I do want to reach out to the ape fans and the ape listeners, and I do want to wish them, you know, the best right now with all this stuff that's going on. It's it's all kind of crazy and weird, and I hope it's not getting to anybody. I hope that, uh, you know, they're doing well and, and they're getting through it okay. With that, I want to let everybody know some news that is going on with the show. But before I say that, I do want to assure everyone that the show will go on regardless of this news. That is that, sorry to say that due to a very hectic schedule consisting of a couple of small projects that I'm heading up and a number of gigs that have come my way, I have found that I pretty much will not be able to continue co-hosting the podcast. It's been an amazing time where I've learned a lot about the Apes universe and have had a really good time talking with Rich and interacting with all the Apes fans about this mutual love we have for the Apes universe. And um, I kind of hope to still be able to come on every once in a while, maybe as a guest. But for now, I think my schedule has kind of been hindering the speed of getting these episodes out. And if I continue as the co-host, it may only start to get slower. And so, therefore, I'm going to leave the show in Richard's hands to do what he sees is right, to continue this into the future. And I just want to say thank you to all the listeners for their ongoing support. And if I can speak for them, I know they will miss the way that you and I would argue over puddles and rivers, vampires, pigs. I tell you, it's... I, when I knew I was going to say this, I figured I would just put it out there. But I'm getting a little emotional here because it has been six years. I've been enjoying meeting people at, you know, the comic book festivals and the sci-fi festivals, listening to the fan feedback. And I'm going to miss all of that. I mean, I won't totally be out of the loop. I'll still be listening to the show as you continue on. But not being part of the conversation with the actual podcast... I'm going to miss that. Well, maybe every once in a while when you find a couple of free minutes, you can write in and we can include <laughs> your comments in the Listen to the Apes segment. <laughs> right. I'll be writing into Facebook. No, Rich was wrong here. Rich was wrong here. And I'll be writing these long paragraphs where everybody will be like, well, in the time it took him to write that, he could have done the podcast. <laughs> but then again, I'll go in and edit this and edit that. Richard was right. He was correct. Everything he always said was... More right than me. 
that just tells me that I can't do any kind of vocal comments on any voicemails or anything. Because I don't, you can't edit my Facebook posts, can you? I can edit everything. (laughs) (laughs) uh Whatever you say or do, I have the power (laughs) to edit. (laughs) Anyway, moving forward. Coming up in just a little bit, we will be recapping and breaking down the second unproduced Planet of the Apes live-action TV series script by Rod Serling titled, you ready for this? Episode 2. It makes sense, but with with Rod behind this, I expected a little bit more. Like, Twilight of the Apes. (laughs) This is probably the hardest part of any show we've ever done. We have some unfortunate news for Talking Apes and the Apes community. Angela Rushmare, who had been helping us with our Facebook page and just being a great friend, has passed away. A few weeks ago, we had asked Ape fans if they had heard from Angela since it had been a while since we had heard from her. And now, thanks to a friend of Angela's, Cam McTeer, who Patrick Izzo got in touch with, she is the one that relayed the sad news that Angela had passed away. Cam had let us know on our Talking Apes Facebook page that Angela had had a heart attack in her sleep at the end of December 2019 and was cremated. Her ashes will be spread with her parents in the near future. Boy, this, even even now, this is just heart-wrenching. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I'm not generally good with this. We had really only talked to her the one time when... You know, we talked to her about helping us out with the Facebook page. But even though we'd only talked to her the one time, you kind of feel like you get to know her because not only was she posting images on our page, but all of the fan pages that we go to, she was posting on those pages too. So pretty much everywhere you went on Facebook, she had a presence. And so she's going to be missed by this community quite quite a bit. She's going to be missed by me quite a bit. I will definitely miss seeing her photoshopped images, especially the one where she would take our faces and put them on Pete and Alan. <laughs> I, I, I can say that Angela really got me. She would always refer to Sarah as my sweetie wife, and she would combine my passions and photoshop pics of Urko and Darth Vader together. But I, I can say my favorite pic of hers, my favorite photoshop pic, is where she showed us why... Erko's helmet always stayed on his head and never fell off. She solved the mystery. Why doesn't Erko's top heavy helmet ever fall off his head? Because he's got a very tall head. And she would show Erko's very tall, like, cone head with, with like, a big giant mullet. <laughs> classic, classic picture. <laughs> yeah, I actually totally forgot about those pictures where she pasted our faces on Pete and Allen, and now I'm flashing back to them, and some of them were just really hilarious. I love the way that she would post pics on the Talking Apes Facebook page of whatever we were arguing about on the latest episode. Once it took me a while to figure out why she was posting pictures of puddles from the animated Apes episode, then it dawned on me, because we were going back and forth about Puddles versus lakes, which one is it? And that was her way of saying she was listening to the show and taking part in her own way. She was a bright center to the Apes fan community. So later on, we're going to read some of your comments left by her friends in our Listen to the Apes segment. And these are comments from the Talking Apes Facebook page when we had put up a post about the about, about Angela's update. And as you will see, she is terribly missed. All right, now, I had asked at the beginning of the show for everyone to please take care of themselves during these really difficult times. And Dr. Zayas also has a a few things to ask also. So he recorded a video and posted it on Dana Gould's YouTube channel for some reason. Don't know why he picked Dana Gould, but here we go. Listen to this. Oh, hello. It's me, Dr. Zayas. Seems like every time I open the newspaper, there's a new group of humans protesting having to stay indoors. It seems like you can't wait to get sick and remove yourselves from the face of the earth. And I say, okie doke. However, before you exterminate yourselves, please 
break down and leave behind the recipe for snowballs. These things are insanely delicious and they're made from the same things as snow tires. That's what, I can't figure it out, but they're so good. They're rubbery yet delicious. That and Mike and Ike's. How do you make Mike and Ike's? More Mike actually. Ever since I read I, Tina, I can't get behind anything named Ike. Now, Mark, I would never peg Zaius for having a sweet tooth, but apparently he does. And I, I can't see him having a hostess snowball, but I can see him with a plate of cheese and a bottle of Chianti. <laughs> yeah, I was a little weirded out by this because I felt like I was missing something. Where does snowballs and Mike and Ike's fit into the apes universe? Is there a reference that I'm missing here? No, but have, have you had a, a hostess snowball? Yeah, I'm not a big fan. (laughs) Well, I don't think anyone is except for Dr. Zayas. (laughs) Actually, my wife is, so... Oh, well, that says something. (laughs) So Dr. Zayas has actually been making his rounds a lot lately. Did you know that he has become the lead of the coronavirus task force? No. He made this announcement on Jimmy Kimmel Live. I have a lot of questions about the president's task force and the mixed messages we've been getting about staying home. So we reached out to the White House, and believe it or not... They connected us with the chief medical advisor to the coronavirus response team, and I am honored to welcome Dr. Anthony Fauci. Hello, Dr. Fauci. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you, but I I, I was under the impression I'd be speaking to Dr. Fauci. Oh, no, no, Dr. Fauci is no longer with us. Why? Why? What? Well, no, the president respects disagreement, and... uh, he respects Dr. Fauci so much that he actually sent him to a big farm upstate where he's free to run around in a field all day with other doctors. I'm, I'm the new lead on the coronavirus task force. And, and you are? Oh, uh, Dr. Solomon Zayas. As in Dr. Zayas, the diabolical minister of science from Planet of the Apes? I've done other movies. Oh, okay. So, doctor, since you are now the guy, what are your suggestions for stopping this this COVID-19? Well, well, first of all, for humans, this is very important. You must wear a mask. You find that masks are most effective against spreading the virus? Uh, No, but they are very effective in covering up your ugly faces. (laughs) <laughs> oh. Come on, Jimmy, you teed me right up for that. You can't, you come in, you, you can't, uh, seriously. You're right. Your faces are disgusting. <laughs> right. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Zayas. Joking aside, I think what we really want to know is how long before we can leave our homes. So you can befoul the environment with your fossil fuels, destroy the forests with your insatiable greed, Contaminate the oceans with your heaps of plastic detritus and wage war over imbecilic differences of religion and race. Yeah, yes. Three to six months. Okay, oh great. Well, that's Dr. Zayas, the new head of, the, of something, I don't know. You know, if Dr. Zayas is making the rounds, I should see if he'll fill in for you in the next episode, Mark. <laughs> That sounds like a good idea. Just make sure you have plenty of host of snowballs on, Anne. Now, let's get into Rod Serling's Planet of the Apes, Episode 2. If you were to find a byline for this, Mark, what would it be? Episode 2, better than Episode (laughs) 1. Very nice. I'll even keep that one in the show. All right. Planet of the Apes, Episode 2, written by Rod Serling. And to give you an overview of the story, Ursus and his security force, which includes his 15-year-old son, Zonda, head out to search for the renegades Alan, Kovac, and Galen. And before long, they find them. The renegades take off, and in the heat of the chase, Alan knocks Zonda unconscious. Suddenly, Alan, Kovac, and Galen are aided by unseen assailants, and the ape soldiers are forced to retreat. These new friends, who are very well cultured and live underground, are curious about Alan and Kovac, who have befriended an animal, Galen. 
They want Galen and Zonda, who was brought with them, put to death until Alan demands they are put on trial to prove they are not as barbaric as the apes. So they are not as barbaric as the other apes. The other, yes, the apes in general. <laughs> Do you want to tell us what you thought of Rod Serling's episode two? <laughs> I can probably say that I liked episode one better than episode two. What? Uh, I know. I Now, I liked- But it's the- in the title, episode two, better than the first, or whatever <laughs> I just said. <laughs> Right, but you know what? Once again, I'm going to have to disagree with Mr. Serling and Mr. Gushowitz. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Surprise! Now, I liked Act 1, where we get to see some great ape action, and we get to meet Urko's, Urko, Ursus's son, Zonda, as the security force hunts down Alan, Kovac, and Galen. But then the script spends more than half of the 62 pages in very talky scenes. And once any show gets into a courtroom setting, you just know there's probably no more action to come. And the script feels like Serling was told he gets one action scene and to write an ape script that has hardly any apes in it at all. And... I know last time we were talking about, did Rod Serling ever see Planet of the Apes before he started writing this script? And I still don't think he has. <laughs> but it does seem like he has at least seen Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Or maybe he just saw a movie still that showed him that a major setting was the New York subway transit system. So th- those are my initial thoughts. What do you have? Well, before I get into my initial thoughts, I got a question for you. Because you say that... Episode one had more action. Yes. And my question, well, maybe it's not really a question. It's more of a statement. There were probably more scenes of action in episode one, but they were all so short and quick that the one action scene in episode two, I think, is still longer than all the action scenes in episode one combined. And I also think it would have taken up a lot more screen screen time than all the ones in episode one combined because the action scenes in episode one were so short so quick that they were over before they practically started so i i think we'll just get into that in a little bit more detail when we get to that scene okay let me now tell you what i thought of this script first of all let's be fair yes the script is 62 pages but take a look at the script the margins are really wide And if you were to set them to today's standards for scripts, you would probably come in closer to the average of 40 to 45 pages. Let's be fair. (laughs) Okay, so other than formatting, what else you got? (laughs) I like the script a lot, a lot more than the previous one. Yes, there are still some issues, like, say, it's not really being himself as discussed in our last episode. But I, too, like the fact that the script starts off right away with a real action scene starts it off with a bang and yeah you're right there's really not a lot of action after that but that first action scene is is really really good and i also really like the introduction of this new character of zonda though if i'm being honest with you i would have preferred his character arc maybe being galen's instead because Galen still seems a little too sidelined for me he's a much more interesting character in the produced show But Zonda has some pretty interesting things going on that we will discuss later, and his potential for future scripts, if they had actually produced this, is pretty interesting. And so I like that character. I agree. And like I said, I liked the first act. I thought it was really good. And Zonda, I would love to see. I want to see Zonda in his own spinoff show. There's so much there. So much brainwashing by Ursus. Yeah, but the stories that I think that could come in future episodes between Zonda and his father could be very interesting. I also didn't mind the fact that the script all of a sudden became a lot of talking after that first action scene because Serling seems to be exploring something real and it never, ever gets boring. Yeah, you know, we could have maybe had a little bit more action towards the end and maybe the courtroom stuff could have been a little less obvious and easy 
with the exception of one Shakespearean moment that I'm sure we'll get into. Oh, yeah, we will. <laughs> but after the last script, I feel that this is a major improvement. And with a couple more drafts, because I do think they did have to do some rewriting, it could have been an interesting addition to the Apes Library. Yeah, I, I still, with that said, I still believe that he was told you get one action scene, but now we need to save on the budget. So make it a lot of exposition and a lot of a lot of talking. But you see, I really didn't think it was a lot of exposition and a lot of talking, because even though it, I guess it kind of was a lot of exposition, a lot of talking, it didn't feel like it because what they were talking about wasn't direct plot oriented stuff. They were exploring the feelings between how apes felt about humans and how humans felt about apes and how similar those feelings were that I actually found it incredibly interesting. Shows don't have to be wall-to-wall -wall action. They just have to remain interesting all the way through. And even with some of the problem areas of the script, I never lost interest in what was happening. Whereas in episode one, I was continuously losing interest in what was happening. I was continuously thinking to myself, if I wasn't doing a podcast on this episode, I would put it down and not finish it. Yeah, we're really looking at this from way different points of view. You know what? I should have mentioned this in the beginning. I I'm looking at this like I'm my five-year-old self again. And when I tuned into that initial Planet of the Apes TV series that we now have, I loved it. There was wall-to-wall -wall action. There, was, there were great characters and there was a, a great balance. And that kept me in Planet of the Apes. As a five-year-old, I wouldn't have had any interest in this. Yeah, but see, the thing is, is I'm not a five-year-old. I can only judge it by what I feel while I'm watching it now, or I should say, as I'm reading it now. And the reader in me right now at my age, where it is, enjoyed this a lot more than that last episode. Yeah, so there's different ways to look at this. And I, th I think we covered it really well there, looking at it from a five-year-old point of view to a, really a budgetary point of view, and you with a, a good story point of view. And I do understand where you're coming from, because the thing that's so great about that first Planet of the Apes movie and that first live-action TV series is that it's good entertainment for the older people watching, and it's also good entertainment for the younger people watching. It actually works on both levels, whereas I understand why this script, this episode two script, would appeal more to an adult audience. Mm -hmm. And as a five-year-old, I would have been switching over to Chico and the Man. <laughs> All right, now, Mark, let's, let's fade into the script. Yeah, let's do it. But before we get started, we should let everyone know that we're going to try something a little different this time. Like when we added clips from the live action and animated shows to help people understand what we were talking about in case they hadn't actually watched the episode, we're going to be reading some of the scenes from the script so that those apes out there who haven't read it yet will get a feel for what we're talking about. And you ape listeners are in for a treat because we're going to hear Mark do, do some acting. I'm just warning you. I, <laughs> I feel like it was important to say that as a nice warning that... Well, yeah, you're going to hear exactly what Rich just oh, said you're going to hear. This is going to be my favorite episode of Talking <laughs> Apes of all time. I will do my Mark best. is a phenomenal actor, everybody. <laughs> all right. Oh, what did I get into? <laughs> Fade in. Now, this episode opens with gorilla soldiers getting ready to head out on a mission. We focus on one young gorilla, Zonda, who is ready to take on the role of active soldier. And this also happens to be Ursus' son. As they head out, they are met by Dr. Zaius, who comes to admonish Ursus for hunting down Alan, Kovac, and Galen. And here we go. You ready? <laughs> okay. Everyone get ready for this. Mark is about to drop some acting on you. Okay, so this is how the scene went down. Shot, entrance to the building. Dr. Zaius is an ancient venerable ape in a waistcoat, beard, and princes. I, I don't know how to pronounce this word, but I, I looked it up and it means glasses. He peers over the glasses towards Ursus. Ursus, we're honored by the presence of the Science Academy President, Dr. Zaius. Zaius. 
I'm not here to honor you. He looks across towards the ranks of the ape soldiery. Sayus, like father, like son, Ursus. I take that as a compliment. Sayus, please don't. The similarity I allude to is in a single-minded ferocity when it comes to the liquidation of the innocents. Such effort, Ursus, such ceremony, everything but battle flags, to hunt down two unarmed humans and a young ape whose principal crime seems to be that they exist. Ursus, our attitudes differ, Doctor. You persist in thinking of this as an execution. We think of it as a safari. Zaius, then may you all come back safe and sound, but with no trophies of the hunt. May those astronauts, Colonel Verdon, Dr. Kvovac, and my young friend Galen, somehow, some way, find sanctuary. End scene. Oh my god, Mark, that was brilliant. <laughs> that was magical. I'm so glad Zaius is only in one scene in this film, because this is the one thing that bothers me more than anything else in this script. Zaius says, may those astronauts, Colonel Verdon, Dr. Kovac, and my young friend Galen somehow, someway find sanctuary. Zaius, I understand if he doesn't want them killed, although the Zaius I'm used to would want them killed after getting as much information out of them as possible. But he's actually saying, I hope you don't find them, and I hope they find sanctuary. Mm -hmm. That's like saying, I hope you don't find them, and I hope they're safe and sound, and they go on their way. And Dr. Zayas would never say that. So actually, can we backtrack for a second? Because we jump straight into this uh, scene with Ursus and Zayas, and I actually want to go back to the scene that happened before this. So anyway, I want to go back to the introduction of Zonda, because Ursus is getting all of the army, I guess, ready to go hunt these humans. And we meet Zonda for the first time. And he is just like his father. He wants to go out and kill the humans. Matter of fact, the words that he says are, as he's play acting, I guess, you know, hunting these humans down. Here's some more acting for you. He says, there's humans on the hill. Bang. There's one crawling through the trees. Bang. Another human coming down the hill. Bang. His only need is to find these humans, hunt them down, and kill them. And Zonda is, the main part of the story for me is Zonda's character arc. And that's why I want to backtrack back to this, because he's a very interesting character. Right now, he's 100% on Ursus's side. He's thinking exactly like his father taught him. And that's important to what makes this episode works so well and we'll go into you know his experiences how he changes how his arc works from this point forward but we first have to start off with his introduction is but just pure let's find these humans and kill them and then another interesting thing happens in this scene we start to see ursus you know as the soldier that we know him as but now because he's a father we're gonna hopefully if they had produced more episodes, I should say, we would have hopefully maybe started to see a different side of Ursus as well. Yeah, and we actually saw a short story in the Tales from the Planet of the Apes book where Urko had a son. Right. And Urko's son was like, hey, maybe this isn't the way. All right, so now we cut to Alan, Kovac, and Galen as they make their way as far, far away as possible. Alan asks Galen what is beyond what the map shows, and Galen tells them that beyond is forbidden territory. Why didn't he call it forbidden zone? Come on, Rod. Uh, it, it's just forbidden territory, just old wives' tales about a deadly species of ape killers. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, so many sub-stories right there. <laughs> and when Galen says that what's out in the forbidden territory is just old wives' tales about deadly species and ape killers, Verdon calls this very imaginative, in which case Galen offers up, isn't it true, though, that all legends have some basis in fact? Perhaps 50, 100 years from now, there will be a legend about gods who arrived here in a silver chariot spewing out flame. Perhaps you and Dr. Kovac are the stuff of legends, Colonel. Mm. I like some of this dialogue because yeah. it's very true. Because if Kovac and Verdon go on and they don't get killed by the apes, they're probably going to start up enough trouble that they will become the stuff of legends. At this point, Galen and Kovac do start to give the viewers a little bit of exposition to kind of catch everybody up. 
which is understandable. Galen says, I was imprisoned and a few hours away from execution because of my friendship with humans. And yet here I sit, here I survive, here I breathe free air. And Kovac responds to this with, Galen, buddy, I'm not going to discourse with you on the fine points of comparative anguish, but you're exiled. The good colonel and I are marooned. We're a thousand years from a day where we were born on a planet that doesn't even exist yet. And our link to that time, that ship of ours, four million pieces of metal fragments spread out all over the landscape, blown to hell. I find this back and forth really interesting because when we get to the trial a little bit later that you were talking about, it's all going to be about ape attitudes versus human attitudes and how they're similar, but yet how they're different. And basically Galen's talking about the position he's now in as he's being hunted versus the position that Kovac and Verdin are in as they're being hunted. And as much as they're both in the same peril, they're there for very different reasons. Right. All right. Now shots are fired. The ape patrol have found them and they go scrambling away. The apes are in pursuit Zonda, who is full of energy, pulls out in front of the squad. Before he can react to his dad, who shouts for him to pull back, Zonda is hit in the side of the face by a rock thrown by Alan and is knocked unconscious. And Ursus reacts with a scream. Mark? I like that, because now we're starting Wait, to hold see Hold on, before Ursus we go on, Mark, I need you to react with a scream. Ah! Oh, wait, wait. No! <laughs> The ape fans, everything Mark does acting wise is just brilliant. I, I love your choices. You're going to make me do all of this acting just because it's my last episode, aren't you? Oh, oh, there's more to come. <laughs> Way more to come. I like the fact that we have Ursus shouting for Zonda to pull back and screaming when he's when Zonda is hit by a rock because we see Ursus as, you know, hard nosed and, you know, very much like we saw Urko, you know. No holds barred. He's going to get what he wants. There's only one thing on his mind. But here with Ursus, we're seeing a reaction to his son being hurt. We're seeing a father. And I like that. I think that that adds an element to Ursus that I'm not sure we ever really got with Urko. We never saw Urko's son in the show. So <laughs> he was only, he only had a laser focus on one thing, one thing only. And I don't think anything would have really made him scream, No! <laughs> he did have a wife. He did have a wife. Had we gotten to that point where we saw his wife, we would have seen Urko scream just like that. But, you know, I like Urko. I'm not putting Urko down. But it might have been interesting to see this different side of him every once in a while. And yeah, we only had one season, so I'm sure we were going to build up to that. Right. Well, anyway, here comes the action scene. All right. Now, suddenly, the apes are attacked by an unseen enemy. Arrows are slung and hit many ape soldiers. And Ursus shouts to his men, back, back. Alan looks over the cliff and sees Zonda barely conscious. He grabs another rock to finish the job, but Galen stops him. He'll give you no more trouble. Ursus and the others hang back as not to be caught by more arrows. Now, let's stop right there. Do you think Ursus would have really stopped right then and there? Or would he have charged forward to get his son? It depends. If he felt like if he charged forward, there would be no way to get his son and he would just get killed, maybe he would stop. It depends on how much thinking goes on inside Ursus's head. Well, there's your problem right there. You think Ursus really thinks <laughs> things through. Well, well, then there's the other side where you would think that he would just not be thinking and he would just charge forward. But you get your answer because he does what you just read. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's your answer. Okay, okay. Alan and Kovac go down and examine Zonda. And Kovac says that wound should be washed. Wait, before we get to this, this action scene, you read it pretty quickly. And so it makes it sound like it's probably a pretty fast action scene. Which it is. But it's not, because the script reads, it goes down ravines, across ponds, up slopes of scrubby hills, through patchy forests, and gradually, barely perceptibly, the apes gain. So they're going 
down ravines, cross ponds, up slopes of scrubby hills, through patchy forests. So this scene is going to last a little while. This is going to be a chase scene that is just going to last quite a while until the action comes to a halt. Then you read, suddenly the apes are attacked by an unseen enemy. Arrows are slung and hit many ape soldiers. So this is a good five to seven minute action scene. This is going to be an exciting scene if shot right. So Kovac, he approaches Zonda, who who is half conscious, and he says... That wound should be washed, even if it can't be sutured. That's what the doctor in me says, and the head should be stomped to finish the job. That's a pragmatic man trying to survive. Yikes. Yikes. That's, <laughs> that's pretty severe. You would never see Pete saying that. Never. Now Galen tells them that they can't leave him there to die, and after some prodding, they pull Zonda up to a hiding spot on top of the cliff, and Kovac says he can help cauterize the wound. After a while, Zonda awakens with Galen sitting next to him. And Mark, this is I know this is one of your favorite scenes. So I'll go ahead and read it. But before we get to the scene, I just want to say that it's real interesting what they're doing with Kovac here because he is, you know, helping cauterize the wound, but he's also conflicted in his head because he says, and the head should be stomped into finish the job. That's a pragmatic man trying to stay alive. So he wants to kill Zonta, but he turns around and he ends up helping him. So there's a lot of character kind of going on inside Kovac right now. And I really, really like that. So, yeah, after a while, Zonda awakens with Galen sitting next to him. This is a really, really good scene. Fade in. Galen, you know who I am? Sonda, and what you are. And if you did this, you do me no honor. Galen, the perversity of the lesser animal known as man, that very unpredictable breed, Dr. Kovac did it, and cleansed the wound, and cauterized it, and probably saved your life. Zonda, where are they? Your friends. Galen, looking around, trying to find who our allies were. Sonda, where are we? Galen, a thousand feet from your father and dedicated comrades. There is silence. Zonda, I'll make a bargain with you. Help me down to where they are. I'll tell them of your cooperation. I'll ask for lenience. Galen reaches out and gently takes the boy's hands off of him. Galen, how cheering will sound by a campfire on a cliff a hundred miles from the barracks. But when I'm marched back in with my hands tied behind my back, what kind of lenience can I expect then? Zonda, my word, Galen. I swear to you, my word. I'll see to it that the worst thing you get is imprisonment. Galen gently forces the boy's head up. Galen, such a gift, Zonda. Lenience puts me inside a barred room for the rest of my life. Zonda stares at him, almost as if disbelieving. Zonda, but the alternative to wander the earth with animals? Galen rises, staring down at the boy. Animals. Zonda, they are animals, clever and devious and dangerous, but animals. Galen, they're different from us. And when things are different, they, they become a menace. Galen, and what is different must be destroyed. I wonder if there is anyone on this earth who understands enough to regret. When we borrowed from man, we took his firearms and his hostility. We took only the bad part of him. Right now, somewhere, Roddy McDowell is standing up and clapping. <laughs> this is a really interesting scene between Zonda and Galen because Zonda, is he being genuine or is he just saying whatever he thinks Galen needs to hear in order to get him to help him get back to his father? Because if he's trying to tell Galen what he thinks Galen wants to hear, he's being kind of stupid because... When he talks about leniency, he's saying he'll ask for it, and the worst that will happen to Galen is imprisonment. What I like about this dialogue here is, you know, he says, I'll ask for leniency. And the fact of the matter is, is if he, if he was older and he was smarter, because he's still only like, what, 15, he's 16 15, years old. 15 so he's, years old. So he's still talking like a kid, so he's not going to give all the right answers. He's going to give... The, the the answers that a 15-year-old would give. So when he says, I'll ask for leniency, like if he was an adult, he would know better. He'd be like, and I'll make sure that you get off. Yeah. I'll tell them that you helped me, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he's still a kid. He doesn't know enough to do that. So he's only asked for leniency. So the fact that what he's telling Galen by saying, you'll only be put in a prison cell or whatever, that's because he's a kid and he doesn't know any better. But also we get to hear Galen's side of everything, you know, 
you're kind of hearing getting a little bit more character arc here from from Galen as well. So this scene really does work as a good character moment of learning about who these two characters are. I it doesn't it still doesn't give me enough Galen. I still feel like Galen's there when Galen's needed rather than Galen being a major character. But I like this scene. I think this scene is really needed in Zonda's journey. Oh, I think this is a turning point for Zonda because right now Zonda is filtering everything through what his dad would say and what has been taught to him. So it's very, very robotic. Right. Well, also, this is perfect placement for the scene too because Zonda hasn't really witnessed anything that Alan and Kovac are capable of you know, as who they really are, I guess you would say, because he's knocked out when Kovac, you know, fixes him up and, and, and helps him out. So at this point, the script is really, you know, nailing that at home that Zonda still thinks they are animals, clever and devious and dangerous, but animals. That's what he says. And this is perfect timing for it, because at, from this point forward, he's going to start to witness what Alan and Kovac are really about. And then later on, when it comes time for his turning point, I think this is going to reflect on him. Yeah, so you're going to see where he goes, but you get a real clear, you get a real clear feeling of where he is. And so it's really kind of cool that they're giving us, hey, this is where Zonda is now. So you understand that. So the when he finishes his character arc, it's all that more powerful. So this is much like the episode from the Ape series, The Good Seed, where you have little Bobby Porter, and he's just like Zonda. He's, he's only, he's thinking everything through of what his dad told him, but now he's beginning to see the other side of it. And by the end, spoiler alert, he now sees a bigger picture and makes a, a more mature li- a mature choice and decision. That's actually a really good callback for this. And I wonder if maybe when they were writing that episode, the idea of, I can't think of the little boy's uh, name, but if his character may have came out of this script. Remus. Bobby Porter played Remus. Remus. I feel like the character arc of Remus in The Good Seed was probably a much bigger arc, and he ends up in a completely different place, but they start in the same place, and they go on the same journey, even if they do end up in a slightly different spot. Right. Remus is ready to accept the humans as as equals, whereas at the end of this episode, I think that Zonda is heading on that journey. And he's made a very good start. And we'll get into this a little bit later. He's starting He's starting on his way to his journey, but he's not at the point where Remus was just yet. Yeah, and I think that the scene with Galen starts that spark within Zonda. All right, just then, Alan discovers something. There is a vast cavernous hole in the ground flanked by a bent, decaying lamppost. Running down into the hole are rotting steps. Did you want to take this one? <laughs> my way out i'm just gonna do the acting thing yep you brought this on <laughs> go ahead mark action kovac questions where does it go and then alan responds where does it go right across manhattan and over to coney island he holds out his hand there's a fragment of glass and on it the legend subway dun 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 oh they're going to eat fresh now <laughs> at subway restaurants eat fresh <laughs> when I first read that, I, I was thinking, oh, are we going to see traces of the trap episode? I thought about that, too, actually. Mm. Fade out. All right. Fade back in at the start of Act 2, interior subway night, high angle looking up. Alan and Kovac walk slowly down the stairway, and Kovac recognize it as what was once New York. They see a hanging light bulb that is still lit, and then they hear the hum of machinery, and they know they're about to eat a giant <laughs> foot-long BLT. <laughs> wow. I don't, I don't know why uh, Rod Serling put that in there, but 
apparently he was going on this whole Subway thing. <laughs> Subway, eat fresh. Do they even have BLTs at Subway? You know what? It's been years since I've been to Subway, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we go to Firehouse, so. Yeah, there you have it. <laughs> All right. Kovac says, you know what happens next? A Subway train goes by, we get on it, and it takes us to Brighton Beach. We'll eat a couple of Nathan's hot dogs, pick up a couple of broads. <laughs> <laughs> it says in the script, I don't want to hear anyone saying anything in an email about how I call a couple of girls broads. <laughs> then we'll run over to the garden for a hockey game or maybe take a handsome ride in Central Park. A handsome ride, that's one of those big carriages built for like <laughs> people on a date. Uh, Kovac continues, and he, he's, he's shouting this, All right, all 20th century ghosts, front and center, all mummified calcified stalking specters come out and do your thing then we see a shot down the length of the platform where suddenly inexplicably more light bulbs suddenly go on i like this little uh speech that kovac gives because it it does two things one it shows us you know what he's missing brighton beach the women the nathan's hot dogs but then it Shows some frustration as he starts to shout out at the 20th century ghosts. You know, it, it, it's a good character moment for Kovac, I think. Yeah, it just says that he's he's still clinging to that hope of they're going to walk down this very dark tunnel at the end will be present day. This will all have been a dream. All right. Now, suddenly, inexplicably, more light bulbs suddenly go on. Alan and Kovac walk down the platform and see a subway car. Standing in the operator's section is a man looking through a cracked window toward them. Mark, take it away. Verdon shouting, who are you? Who's in there? Various lights begin to come alive. Naked bulbs strung out strategically, switched to life by some unseen hand, and revealing several humans lined up along the side of the tunnel on the platform of the waiting area. Many are armed with bows and arrows. All stare Toward the two astronauts, the collective looks are inquisitive, but not necessarily friendly. One archer steps forward and points toward the subway car. Verdon and Kovac start to walk toward it. Okay, so this is the reveal of who saved them outside, because we have many of these humans, they're armed with bows and arrows. And was there ever any doubt in your mind that it was humans that saved them? Oh, I knew it was. I never had a doubt either, so I'm not sure how much of a mystery that was. But I thought it could have been cool if they had maybe tried to go in a different direction and it had been apes down there. Like there were rebel apes who wanted to help the humans maybe they run into. I kind of wish they had gone in a different direction and surprised us here. But that being said, this still works. I just wish they'd. it could have been better if they had been a little bit more imaginative. Well, I, I actually thought, since we were seeing traces of Beneath the Planet of the Apes, I thought there were going to be mutants. Yeah, and I was kind of glad not to see that because I was so seeing traces of the animated series. Oh, the Underdwellers? The, the Underdwellers. Ooh. And I just, I was kind of thinking to myself, I'd like something different here. And if I was in the writer's room, I might have suggested, wouldn't it be really neat if there were these rebel apes that were helping the humans? And it might have been something different. But on the other hand, I was also thinking like a producer, and I knew it was not going to be apes. It was not <laughs> going to be mutants. They were just going to be humans in tattered wardrobe. Were you surprised at all that it wasn't mutants? I wished. I wished there were going to be mutants. But knowing that this is TV and they're on a strict budget, I knew it was not going to be mutants. <laughs> I think the reason I kind of knew it wasn't going to be mutants was because if it was going to be mutants, they would have been using their mind powers as opposed to bow and arrows. Yeah, but walking you down know? into the subway, I thought, okay, this is where it all ties together. But that's not the right, way Right, right. But... Remember, mutants were using those illusions of fire and stuff like that, not not actual weapons. Yeah, but once once again, thinking like a producer, I was not thinking about that <laughs> because that's way too much budget. So, but I'm just saying that's probably why I didn't think that it was mutants. Although I saw the connection, ultimately, I didn't think we were going the mutant route. Yeah. And we didn't, so. Okay, so they're, they're humans. Let's get over that. <laughs> Alan and Kovac enter the train to talk to the man inside and wonder if they are the ones that they should thank for helping them by attacking the ape patrol. The group of other people stay outside. When asked if he speaks, the man says, Man, that's you, Mark. 
Okay, here I go. The man answers, with some fluency. We also read, yes, we have electricity. Yes, we have a generator powered by gasoline. And yes, it supplies light and air. And you too. You run from apes and with apes. And we find that intriguing. Oh, so they, they've been watching them for quite some time. Well, they didn't necessarily have to watch them for quite some time. True. They could have just seen the scene that happened outside. That, you know, you're absolutely correct. However, when I first <laughs> read this up until now, I was thinking that these these people were tracking the three of them. But you're right. They could have just seen them outside fighting. But there's a little piece of me that thought, ooh, maybe they've been they've been watching them. Right. And we're getting a very different kind of human here because these humans, they read, they have electricity. They're cultured. They have generators. They like sandwiches. <laughs> but the thing is, is in all the other Planet of the Apes universes, you know, uh, they, you know, they didn't have this stuff. In the television show, they talked, but they didn't read. They didn't really have electricity or generators or anything like that. So giving these humans... All of this makes me start to wonder where they were planning on going with the human-ape relationship if these scripts had been produced, because the humans would have even been closer to the apes and who they are and what they're about, and they would have gotten rid of all that primitive stuff. I mean, you're still living in primitive society, but they still have all these kind of modern conveniences. I'm kind of looking at this now, like these people are the humans from Battle for the Planet of the Apes. They're humans, they're a little bit mutantified because of all of the radiation, but yet they're they're cultured, they're smart, they can read, they can drive. Yeah, it's not feeling as it's as far into the future as episode one wanted us to believe, because episode one wanted us to believe that this happened after Taylor had landed. So it's all that way into the future. But if you want to go off of when Taylor landed, then humans wouldn't have this electricity, uh, wouldn't have this generator. I just feel like, you know, I'm not against this. It's very different than what I am used to. But if you take out of episode one, all the ties to Taylor. So they want us to, the first episode wanted us to believe this took place after Taylor landed. And if you, you take out all the Taylor stuff from that last episode and just say that they landed in a totally different time and a totally different place the way the Purdue shows did, then I'm on board with having these very different humans. But because they have them landing right after the time of Taylor. But we don't know that. We don't know how, well, yeah, yeah, they did land after Taylor, but how long? At, that could have been years after Taylor had landed. Yeah, but they make it sound like it's less than 10 years. If you go back and reread that episode... Well, I think that's, that's your interpretation. Well, I think it's... To me, it felt pretty clear. So... This stuff doesn't make sense. We get rid of episode one, which we should do anyway... And rewrite, a, rewrite that first episode so that Taylor's not involved. I'm okay discovering a new set of humans. Uh, I agree, but why... These people could have been down in that subway learning and reading way before Taylor could have gotten there. Yeah, but because we know the 1968 movie with Taylor, we know that this isn't how humans acted. Because we just saw them in one small community. We didn't see outside of Ape City. Well, I... You know, that's true. That's a good point. And I know also a lot of people are going to be like, well, what about canon? You were talking about canon in the last uh, in the last episode, and that wouldn't be canon with the way Planet of the Apes is. But if you look at all the different Planet of the Apes series and movies, you go from the movies to the live action TV show to the animated show, there are slight changes that are made to accommodate the each one of these series is having their own world. But I feel like these kind of humans could have worked while still staying true to Planet of the Apes as a whole. And you just made a point that makes me even feel stronger about that because different parts of the world, humans might be acting very differently. So these humans are not the humans that we encountered in that first movie with Taylor. Right. So I can be on board with that. I just feel I would be more on board with it if they weren't trying to say that this took place, you know, not that long after Taylor. All right, now, you know what? Let's, let me ask you this. In the TV series that we have now, would you have liked to have seen these kinds of cultured humans or still the slaves that we see in the TV series? 
You know, I love the TV series. I don't want to change anything about that TV series. Would this have worked in that TV series? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's just that I think the TV series that was eventually produced was on the right track and everything it was doing, with the exception of the horse race. And so, no, I... I, I don't really want to see any changes made to what they ended up doing. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen these humans in the Planet of the Apes TV series. Because whenever you see the humans in the series, like, well, they're, they're just going to be beaten no matter what. And they're always going to be the race beneath the apes. Yeah, but this way, it's like, oh, who who's going to win this war of the apes? And I could see them as, as an uprising. For me, it would have been more tension. It would have been more excitement if we had seen these humans. But you got to look at the humans in the live action TV series a little bit differently. It's not that they were always going to be servants because Pete and Alan were going to teach them about their potential. And so by having them start on a very primitive level, now they have a lot more room to grow, to become, and to realize the potential of what humans can be. Whereas... Well, we don't know that. No, because they canceled the show but if that's where the show had been heading which is my feeling of you know that's where the show was heading because that was Zayas's big fear right and so you start on a primitive level and then you show them their potential with this kind of human that we have here where they already have electricity and they already read and they already speak with like fluency although i guess they kind of spoke pretty fluent in the live action tv series the way it was produced but they have built them up so much in this script to be able to read have electricity they're already halfway to three quarters of the way towards where they need to go. So by starting them on that primitive level, it's a much more interesting journey because they got so much more to learn. I like the way they, they portrayed the humans and the apes in Battle for the Planet of the Apes. You never knew which one was going to reign supreme. And I, I love that dynamic. But with that, apes, apes out there, ape listeners, tell us what you would like. We want to hear <laughs> from you. So, Mark, let's continue with the script. Now, okay. Kovac, he tries to explain that to the these new human friends, quote-unquote friends, he tries to explain to them that Galen is a friend, which the man has a hard time getting his head around. Right, so the man responds to Kovac talking about Galen as a friend by saying, a friend? An ape as a friend? An ape can be one of two things. He can be the enemy, or he might be a pet. But for ape? And man to be friends? He shakes his head. And Kovac then responds to that by saying his eight brethren think the same thing. This guy is a shadowy reflection of Ursus. Right, right. So, but anyway, his eight brethren think the same thing, which is why he's running with us. Once again, this is very interesting because the man is talking a certain way. And then Kovac's coming back and making us understand that the apes feel the same way. So if you were to go to an ape and say, you know, this human is a friend, an ape would say, a friend? A human as a friend? A human can be one of two things. He can be an e the enemy or he might be a pet. So, I mean, the ape would say the exact same thing. Just replace the word ape with human. And so this is, once again, something very interesting going on in this script where we're seeing the apes and humans as kind of the same thing you know they got their differences but they're so similar oh yeah oh yeah they're 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 mirror images of each other and i, I love that dynamic all right now an onlooker from the crowd steps forward leans across the table and whispers something into the leader's ear i wish they give these people names the man nods and looks up toward verdon and kovac man i'm told there is yet another ape one of their security police kovac he was wounded. We took him with us. Murmurs from the crowd, and then an errant laugh. Verdon, I said something funny? Man, mildly funny. First you hit this ape in the head with a rock, then you solicitously is that a word? Soliciously? <laughs> carry him to the top of the cliff and administer to him? Kovac, what would you have done? Left him down there to die? Which is weird, because I think that's kind of what Kovac wanted to, to do initially. You know, he didn't he say he wanted to stomp in his head? Yeah. Isn't that what we talked about? But the better Kovac thought differently. Right. The man rises from the table and says, Mr. Space Traveler, or whoever you are, we were the ones who skewered his companions with our arrows. It was our intention that he die down there. And what was your intention? You run with apes. You befriended apes. Is there some brotherhood that we've not heard of? Kovac, we just have a disinclination to leave a person to die. 
There's a louder murmur from the crowd, and with it, the first sense of real hostility. The man leans forward across the table. He says, a person? What happens to the senses out there in space? You think these loping, hairy imitators of a man are persons? You lose sight and smell out there in the stars? He pounds on the table. <laughs> Apes is what they are. And with your impaired hearing and impaired sight, you think that you put clothes on an animal that makes him some kind of dancing partner? Kovac, he's sufficiently your equal to keep you living down here in a pit. Or maybe you wander around underground from choice. There is a hush collective intake of breath at this, and the onlookers, as if they were preparatory to some giant explosion, the man looks down at the table, then raises his head. He says, hardly from choice, only from desperation. The ape outnumbers us a thousand, two thousand, five thousand to one. He has weapons, firearms. We have bows, arrows, and rocks. But we have something that will ultimately make us the conqueror of the ape. Books. Knowledge. Where you're standing at this moment was once a vast city. In our excavations, we keep coming up with clues from the past. The generator, for example. It was covered with some preservatives, and we learned how to use it. Not too far from here, we unearthed a library, and gradually we're learning from the books. This last paragraph is really interesting to the Planet of the Apes lore, because if these people are learning all this stuff from the books and being able to figure out generators on their own... What do we need Verdon and Kovac for? Because the whole entire idea in these Planet of the Apes series is, is basically that these two humans from space, they're dangerous. They could teach these people all this stuff. But in reality, they don't need Verdon and Kovac to teach them anything. They're already learning it all. They are, but it's like theory and practice. These humans have have a theory because they've been reading the books and a little bit of practice. But Alan and Kovac, they've got a lot of practice, so I think they could speed up their learning. They could really rebuild a city much faster than they could have on their own. Interesting. Hmm. It's just a different way to go. It's it's not necessarily bothering me here as as I'm reading it. Just as we're going over it, it's kind of causing some questions in my head. Okay. Just then, another man hurries in and tells the leader they have captured Galen and Zonda, who the leader is planning to send on their way in a way that the apes would never offer humans with merciful deaths. This is really interesting because when you first read this dialogue where he says this, it sounds like he's going to say he's going to let them free. Oh, I never got that. And then he says with merciful deaths. And, oh, he's talking about just not torturing them, but he's still going to kill them. So then when Verdon tells the man that Galen is a scientist, as they're talking, he tells the man that Galen is a scientist, a curious thing happens. The man says, a scientist, an ape scientist, at the very most, a mimic in a costume, an ape is an ape. And this comment I found really confusing because... If these humans, I know they're hiding out underground and maybe they're not seeing everything, but they know what they're hiding from. So how does he not know that these apes are scientists and stuff? I mean, he must know that they talk. He must know that they ride horses. They must know what they're hiding from, which means that apes have gotten pretty intelligent. This was one line that I didn't like because this was one line that doesn't make sense. I feel like the man should have known that the apes have gotten this far in their intelligence. Maybe this guy has only seen apes in, in, in a very bombastic way. Whenever you see apes, they're always killing or maiming something. But a scientist? Mm, not really sure, because how would he have ever seen an ape scientist before? He's only seen the Grand Army. You know what you're running from. You've seen what you've run from, which means you've seen apes... With guns, you've seen them riding horses, you've seen them speaking to each other, probably pretty intelligently at times. I'm not sure they ever got that close. I, I don't get the feeling like that's that's true, though. I mean, how could they have not gotten that close? W would you have gotten that close to the ape security force? Right, but some of them might have been captured at one point and escaped. It seems to me like they should be aware enough of their surroundings that they would know that an ape can be a scientist and it's not just a mimic in costume. Those soldiers out there are not just mimics in costumes. 
They're actual soldiers. All right, now, trying to save his friend, Alan suggests that they prove that these humans are more civilized than the apes by putting Galen on trial. And this ends Act 2. Yeah, it's an interesting end to Act 2 as well, because the humans, they're just talking about killing the apes, killing the apes, killing the apes. And I like how Verdon, which, by the way, just those people who are getting confused... It's Alan Verdon, but Verdon is the way it's written in the script. But you're just used to calling him Alan from the produced shows. Yeah, I, I can't call him Verdon. To me, he's, he's always Alan. But with this scene, I find it very interesting that Verdon is able to manipulate these humans by convincing them that they, if they think they are more civilized than the apes that are outside. Ah, do you think he's trying to manipulate them? Or is he trying to prove his point? What I think he's trying to do is buy time in order to save Zonda and Galen's life. And so in order to do that, I think he's even going to say this a little bit later, he manipulates these humans by, you know, convincing them you're, you know, acting as if the apes outside aren't civilized, but you're not civilized either. That forces the man's hand to say, well, what do we need to do to prove to you that we're more civilized? I agree. And that's when uh, Alan offers up, we'll put these guys on trial. I agree that he's trying to manipulate them. There's a point where Verdon even says, and I think this is the the the, the kicker, because as, as a human, what are you going to say to this? Except for, well, how do I prove that we're more civilized? Verdon says, all I see is that we've met ape and we've met man. And we still haven't found a civilization. And I think that right there is is a truth. And it's a Rod Serling truth. You know, Rod Serling's proving a point. But I think the character is trying to get Galen and Zonda a way out. And so he's manipulating the situation. He's saying, I don't think he's expecting a trial. I think he's expecting to say, prove you're more civilized, let them go. But that's not going to work. That's not going to happen. So he says this line about still having finding a civilization. And that really is a great manipulation line to get the other side to say, well, how do I prove it to you? Fade up on act three. Something that's close to a courtroom has been set up and a jury has been selected. Alan is introduced to Dempsey, who will serve as a judge, and Fallon, the prosecutor. In the other room, Kovac is rebandaging Zonda's head, and Zonda inquires on why he is going through all this trouble to help. So, Mark, action. Kovac responds with a shrug. Why not? If I ever start a practice around here, you can drop off a testimonial to me. Ha 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 ha. Hold on, I'm sorry. I'm going to provide a laugh track. Ha 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 ha. Zonda looks towards Galen, who sits dejectedly on the floor in a corner. Zonda, why don't you explain to your mad friend that he's wasting his time? Why would he say that? I don't know. Boy, he's a kid. But, you know, he's a kid. He's still set in his ways. Yeah, but still, someone's trying to help you put put your head back together. You don't say that you're wasting your time? You know 15-year-olds. They don't speak with their – they don't think before they speak. Okay, asterisk, that's only at Mark's point of view, not mine. All <laughs> I'm right. going to get all these bad <laughs> messages. Glad you're gone. Signed, 15-year-old fan. For all you 15-year-olds, <laughs> don't you dare go see Mark, who lives in Culver <laughs> City at 123 Fake Street. Do not go there. <laughs> yeah, I live in the Forbidden Zone. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> so let's continue the scene. Ferdinand is allowed into the room at this point. Then the door closes and we hear it lock from the outside. Verdon, we're not wasting it, Sonny. We're borrowing as much as we can. See, he's not wasting time. He's trying to create time so that they can figure this out, which is what I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I, I agree, but I think just a little part of Alan who just wants to show the humans what's what. You're right. Moving on. Right. Okay, so Galen says, but the fact is, Colonel, a trial? Verdon, a trial takes time. It uses up minutes. And for every minute we can beg, borrow, steal, or usurp, that's another minute that you stay alive. Galen, prolonging the inevitable? Verdon, snapping, maybe, and maybe, just maybe, we've run across a group of humans who have enough memory genes to recall a time when sometimes mercy went hand in hand with justice. I have a question for you. (laughs) Do you remember a time when humans... (laughs) 
<laughs> do, do you remember a time when mercy went hand in hand with justice? Nope. Cause... No, I do not. Here we are in 2020, and I that still has not happened. <laughs> so I thought the same thing. I mean, I I guess there's some some places where this does exist. And if you look, watch the news sometimes, you'll see it. But I see so much out in today's world where I wish there was some mercy that went hand in hand with justice. Not in our time, buddy. Not in our lane. Yeah. Not in our just, lane. Yeah. All right. The trial begins yeah. where Galen and Zonda are brought up on charges of murder, kidnapping, and forced servitude and destruction of property. So they're, they're going way back on this. They're not even applying what's happened today. Alan tells the court that Galen was not part of the security force and is therefore innocent. And Zonda, he's, he's underage and therefore is also not responsible for the actions in which he is accused. So these two are being blamed for the ape society up until this point. They're being blamed for everything that, that Ursus and his security force have done. That's not fair. Right, and we're going to get into that in a couple of seconds because the trial is totally going to go there to the point where it's like, it's not about what you did. It's about what we've seen your kind do, how we're worried about what you might do in the future. But you're right, that isn't fair, but they're not they're not going to get a fair trial here. Are you kidding me? Right. So at least at this point, we're thinking they're not going to get a fair trial here. No. Well, okay. Now, next, Zonda is asked by Fallon if he was on an expedition to kill and capture humans. And his answer pretty much amounts to yes. <laughs> well, Zonda, you're an idiot. You really are a stupid gorilla. Right. He doesn't say yes. It's just. The many things he says pretty much just amounts to yes. And he is. is Once again, he's a kid. He's a kid with conviction. He's a kid who believes in his beliefs and he's not backing down from them because even though he's witnessing certain things up to this point, it hasn't completely clicked. Well, then Ursus should teach him a whole different class of when you are when you are captured, tell the captives whatever they want to hear. OK, right, right, right. But I think, you know, I think. It's getting to him, you know, what he's seeing, how, you know, the humans are helping him and hearing what Galen's saying. It's it it just that one last thing has to be said to make it click. And I and, and that's what this trial is hopefully hopefully going to do. That does not happen right here because Zonda is asked if he had a weapon and if he regretted using it. And Zonda replies, I regret not killing a human with it. I was wounded before that could happen. Zonda, <laughs> shut your mouth. Stop talking. <laughs> See, I told you, 15-year-olds, they, they don't think before they speak. If you were on trial and someone said, hey, Mark, if you had a, a weapon, would you think about killing us humans? I think as a 15-year-old, Mark, you would say, oh, I would never touch a weapon and, and killing a human? <laughs> no, I love you people. Now, I'm going to be on my way. <laughs> You, you humans are so correct. Us apes are so wrong. I'm going to go back right now and tell my dad all about this. So don't even bother following me. And we, this is all a big misunderstanding. That's what I would have said as a 15-year-old. Yeah, no, I, I, I see your point. I just really like Zonda, so I want to defend him a little. <laughs> all right, good. That's all, that's all I want to hear. And you know what? I'm going to edit in that little clip throughout the whole show. Every time I'm arguing with you, you're just going to put that. <laughs> yep. I don't know. I, I totally understand where you're coming from. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, I love my sound clips. All right. Now, okay. when it's Verdon's turn to defend and question Zonda, we get this exchange. Okay, here we go. Verdon says, Zonda, what are humans? Zonda replies, animals, inferior animals. <laughs> Zonda needs a lawyer right now to say, Zonda, stop talking. Yeah, where, where, where's Verdon to object or do something? <laughs> you know, he's just letting him go on, even when he's cross-examining him or, or even when he's asking the questions. In the screen direction, he's pointing to his mouth, giving him the zip it, zip it, zip it. <laughs> so we continue. Verdon asks, who told you that? Zonda with a shrug. It's a known fact. Verdon, you learned it in schools? Your parents told you that? Your friends? Your teachers? Zonda, everyone. Verdon, what else did they tell you of humans? Zonda, that they are ferocious, clever, untrustworthy. Oh, Zonda. Go ahead, say it. Zonda. Oh. <laughs> Zonda, you, you just don't know when to stop, do you? 
<laughs> I'm just going to put pauses in whenever <laughs> something like that is said. Dempsey pounds on the table with a makeshift gavel. Dempsey, that will be quite enough. We know what apes think of his humans. Make your point, Colonel Verdon. Don't waste our time. All right, suddenly we have someone like Dempsey to come in and say, Zonda, stop it. Stop. You're talking right now. I'm going to cut you right. right there before you say <laughs> something even worse. Right. Well, here's we should be clear here because I don't know if we said this earlier, but Dempsey is the judge. Yes. And so he says that will be quite enough. We know what apes think of humans. I don't necessarily think that he's stopping him to... The health help? Of, no, he's not. Zonda? He's not. He just doesn't want to hear anymore. <laughs> this is just what I, 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 <laughs> my interpretation right now. Right. So we continue. Verdon turning towards Dempsey. My point, Your Honor, is that you're seeking to condemn a teenage boy. <laughs> Shot the crowd. A woman rises and shouts, He is not a boy. He's an ape. Wow. Meryl Streep, watch out. <laughs> There's a loud roar of assent, pounded fists. Stomped feet, and Dempsey has to pound on his gavel again to restore order. Verdon, the teenage boy, Your Honor, who's been fed an attitude. He's had a point of view thrust into him like a needle. To think of humans as animals was as natural to him as breathing. Now do you condemn a boy for an attitude poured into him from birth? Yep. Fallon, the prosecutor, says, when the attitude takes the form of acts of violence against human beings, Verdon, he took no lives. Dempsey, his intent was to take lives. Kovac, he was ordered to. Okay, so this is actually all really interesting stuff. What they're basically saying is that, or they're actually questioning, is this Zonda's fault? This is what he's learned. This is what he's been taught to believe. He's not a bad ape. His thinking's just all screwed up because of what his parents, his teachers, and everybody else has taught him. So pretty much Kovac is telling him to plead insanity. Right. Well, the thing is, is it's always been my thinking when I see how kids act and everything, and parents will blame everything. They'll blame movies. They'll blame their teachers. Parents have got to take the responsibility, too, and we have to teach our kids right. And so Zonda here is just acting out what he, is, what he was always taught was right. That doesn't make it right to do, though, and so it's hard to argue that and still be on Zonda's side because I kind of feel sorry for him because he's just doing what everybody he looked up to said you're supposed to do. So this is a really, really great conversation here. I understand why a five-year-old Richard probably wasn't enjoying this part of the show, but as an adult, I'm listening to it and I'm fighting you know, my thoughts inside my head where it's kind of like... God, but he was brought up to believe this. Is, you know, why are we punishing him? Why are we not punishing the people who taught him this? But in the long run, he's doing wrong and he's he's killing humans or he's going out to kill humans and that's wrong and you got to be punished for that. And there's this fine line of what's right and what's wrong and how do we figure it out? And all of this is being discussed on a show that was originally supposed to be geared for for kids. I uh, I agree wholeheartedly. They are stuck between a rock and a hard place. And you're right. This is what he was taught from birth. So this is what he's going to do. You can and can't fault him. Just like having work with kids. When kids say something harsh, which sometimes they do, I never get upset with the kid because where did you hear that? Who told right. you that? And you you know it was the parents, or if they had seen it on TV or somewhere on YouTube, why aren't the parents monitoring what they're watching? If they're saying the things that they're saying, then they should be watched a little bit closely. And even in, in the house, parents should really watch what they're saying around their kids because those are the attitudes that the kids are going to adopt and going to repeat and think those are the truths. And yeah, right now, they, this, this court is like, we probably know this, but if we let this kid go, he's going to end up murdering a whole bunch of us probably someday. Right. Well, I believe a man in the crowd stands up and says you let them loose and put a rifle in their hands you'll see how much jeopardy they'll put us in mm -hmm. yeah you know and this is why i like the script it's challenging me mentally it's causing me to think yeah there's not all that action but stuff like this is really causing me to think and it's like what would i do because i understand that zonda is you know, only acting as he was taught. So, so where do you draw the fine line? Where do you, 
where do you go with this? You know, you can't let him go. Do you kill him like they want to do? Do you put him in jail? Do you try to retrain him and, and, and see if you can get him to understand, you know, the way things really are and that you can't just be killing humans and humans can't just be killing apes? Where do you go? And that's a really great thing about episode two as opposed to episode one, which had nothing to really teach us. This one is really having some strong, active conversations that cause us to question in our head right and wrong, and what do you do when somebody's being wrong when they didn't really know any better, and is that an excuse? Oh, and for me, it it shows that parents, watch what you say around your kids. Watch what you let them hear, because... And for a kid, they're sponges, and they're going to absorb that. And if they're if they're not told right from wrong, then they may make really bad decisions. Right. All right, Mark, so give us Fallon's closing argument. Okay, so this is Fallon's closing argument, which is kind of strange, I have to say, because Galen has yet to take the stand, and we're already doing closing arguments. Have any of you ever met an ape with human attributes? Have any of you ever been helped by an ape, comforted by an ape, had a wound treated or an ailment cured by an ape? Do any of you feel free to walk out of here and move across the land without fear of capture or killing by the apes? They are guilty of all the crimes attributed to them. They should be put to death. This is a weird closing argument because he's saying, you know, have you ever been helped by an ape, comforted by an ape? But for this to be a closing argument for this trial, shouldn't it be, have any of you ever been helped by these two apes, comforted by these two apes, had a wound treated or an ailment cured by these two apes? Because they're the ones on trial. Yeah, he's putting the whole ape species on trial here. Exactly. And that, to me, is wrong. You know, they should not be getting blamed. Well, I can see where he's going. Yeah, but they shouldn't be blamed for what other apes have done. Very true, but I can see where he's going. You know, as we learned in the live-action TV series, you know, as Alan, Pete, and Galen were, you know, traveling through the lands, they met plenty of apes who were willing to help out the humans and were nice to the humans. So you can't judge two apes by the acts of, what, 5,000 other apes? I mean, I... I understand their concerns. I understand why this is all happening. They're fearing for their life. But when you really look at it and what's being said, it just all feels wrong. All right. So now now Galen asks to speak his closing argument. You know, it was weird when Galen asks to speak. I don't know if he was actually asking the closing argument. He just wanted to speak because you'll notice that. Nope. Nobody ever gave him a chance to talk. All of a sudden, Fallon's giving his closing argument, and Galen was never questioned. It's like, well, that's not fair. Well, I think they're just rolling all the apes into <laughs> one person. I guess. But De- Galen does ask to speak, and he's given permission to speak. And this is what he says. <clears throat> Give us everything you got. This has got to be like, you know, Caesar's speech in oh. Conquest. Oh, oh, oh you, set, you, you set a very high bar there. <laughs> I have only this to say. What is it you accuse us of? Is it murder? I don't think so. Not just murder. Neither of us have ever taken a life. But we stand guilty of something else. Because what we're accused of is being apes. And we have no defense. We're accused of being animals. And how can we deny that we're animals? Hear me now, for I ask a very simple thing. I ask that you put me to death in place of this other animal. He points to Zonda. All that's needed here is proof of man's superiority. All right. Won't one death of one ape suffice? Let me die and let this young one go. You will then have your ape victim. You will have your proof of the sovereignty of man. And you will also have demonstrated that not only can man reason, He can be compassionate. And what more proof of superiority is there than that? I guess he's trying to prove that apes aren't all that bad because he's saying, kill me, let the other ape go, and you're going to get exactly what you want. You're going to show your superiority, but you're also going to show your compassion. And so he's willing to risk his life so that these humans can see, you know, that apes can be also compassionate. So I think he's got two two agendas here, save Zonda's life and also convince the humans that 
apes can be compassionate. Matter of fact, there's a little bit of wordplay here because he's being compassionate towards Zonda. Hey, humans, are you going to show you can be compassionate too? All right, from there, Kovac then starts referencing Shakespeare. I'm so glad he didn't call him Apespear. And this is why I liked episode (laughs) one more than episode two. Had they said Apespear, I would have said this is the ultimate ape story of, forget the films, TV shows, animated shows, this, this is it right here. The ultimate in ape storytelling. If they had just said Apespear, they dropped the ball, let's move on. Right, but he says Shakespeare, so everybody knows that's a big step up for me because they all know how I feel about those apisms. So, Mark, now continue with this ape-tastic show, okay? <laughs> okay, so go back. As he's quoting Shakespeare, he says, The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives <laughs> and him that takes. I'm sorry, I'm not really good with Shakespeare, so just bear with yeah, me on this. I don't think anyone is. Galen picks up the speech and continues quoting from The Merchant of Venice. Hold on, you know, before you continue with this, let me just tell everyone, and including myself, remind myself what The Merchant of Venice is, so maybe that'll give you some context. How's that? Okay. Now, according to Wikipedia, The Merchant of Venice is a 16th century play written by William Apespear. Uh, Shakespeare, I'm sorry. Wikipedia said Apespear? It did, yeah, it did. <laughs> in which a merchant in Venice named named Antonio defaults on a large loan provided by a Jewish moneylender, Shylock. <laughs> now, now that you know what the Merchant of Venice is, are we all clear? Okay, so I can tell you how Galen picks this up by saying, "'Tis mightiest in the mightiest.'" It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attitude to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above the sceptred away. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attitude to God. Himself and earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seizes justice. Very well said. Very, very well said. <laughs> Do you have said, any Mark. idea what was said? Not a clue. Not a clue at all. Yeah, I I never could understand Shakespeare either, but I heard words like mercy, twice blessed. So I figured it must have made sense to Dempsey and some of the others because of what's going to happen at the end of this episode. <laughs> but it kind of causes me to not understand what happens at the end of this episode because I have no idea what this, this Shakespeare is saying i'm now picturing if this was a produced show you cut to the jury and all shaking their heads like oh i get it now thank goodness richard read from wikipedia because now we all understand this yeah so and we're gonna get to this in a in a minute or so but i didn't understand what was being said either but i think dempsey understood it because of the outcome that's about to happen so Let's move on to the next scene, because we're actually not going to get a verdict here in the courtroom. They're going to leave it as a reveal. They're going to leave it as a mystery until the next scene. So we dissolve to Ursus and his soldiers. Okay, Ursus and his sol. Oh, okay, good. Now, we're dissolving away from the courtroom to Ursus and his soldiers. They have somehow found where Zonda had been taken. They are about to attack when they see Zonda walking slowly, carefully down the pathway of loose rocks. Ursus goes to meet him and wonders if this is a trap. Zonda says no and turns to wave back at Galen, Verdon, and Kovac. So apparently the Merchant of, of Venice really got him off the hook. Right. I don't understand why. I wish that they had used something a little bit more understandable because a lot of people have problems with, with uh, Shakespeare. I don't even think Rod Serling knew how to get out of that, so he dissolved away before we saw how the Merchant of Venice helped, and they never showed how the humans came to their verdict. Everything's uh, everything's, uh, happy now, they let the two apes go, and I don't know why they let the two apes go, because I didn't understand what that Shakespeare quote meant, and so I don't know what happened. (laughs) Well, there's your answer right then. They're all back in the courtroom going, what just happened? And Alan and Verdon and Galen are like, okay, now that we know everything, we're, we're just going to slip away from here. And 
They're all looking at each other like, what is, someone make me a sandwich, okay? Right, but, but. I want a Philly cheesesteak right now. I don't understand any of this. But Dempsey's going to join them on top of the hillside. Because he's trying to look smart. He's trying to look like he understood everything. All right, guys. Oh, I see your point. Keep in touch. I do like this moment, though, of Zonda, you know, saying no, that it's not a trap, and then looking back and waving at them, because even though they're not basically saying that Zonda is a changed ape, the fact that he can look back and wave means that he's starting that journey to become a changed ape and maybe understand humans a little bit more. And I think that if this show had continued with and they had produced this and we had gotten more episodes and Zonda had become a big part of that, his journey to learn to appreciate humans while being the son of Ursus who only wants them dead could have been a really, really cool thing to have in the Planet of the Apes universe. Oh, very much so. But this is why I like episode one more, because they didn't end it with a cheat. They didn't give us an ending. They gave us a dissolve. Well, that's because they were trying to create mystery to make you go, oh, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened. And then they had a reveal. No, they don't even. Rod Serling didn't even know what was going on. I think what they were trying to do, or what Rod Serling was trying to do, was to create a mystery and then give you a reveal when you see Zonda and then Kovac, Allen, and Galen. Oh, yeah, the mystery uh, mystery is, what just happened? Why didn't they give us an ending? Well, they do kind of give us an ending, but it's an no, ending. No, they didn't. That... They didn't say how this transpired. Well, that I agree with. Okay, what from the Merchant of Venice got them off the hook? You know, if we were talking to Rod Serling right now, what he would say, he would say, I did give you an ending. I did give you that. It's not my fault that you don't understand Shakespeare. <laughs> well, <laughs> c- come on. Who who understands Shakespeare, okay? Something like with the Merchant of Venice. Give us something else. <laughs> give us something more definitive. I agree with you. I think that Serling thought that we would get it. We didn't get it. And so it doesn't necessarily work. So, yeah. Serling, not only did I not get it, no one else got it. Try again. <laughs> well, like, Shakespeare <laughs> scholars probably got it. They, they don't even understand Wait. Shakespeare. Dempsey got it. <laughs> hey, he's pretending he got it. No one understands this stuff. They just act like they do. I wonder if they could have actually done without the Shakespeare and just ended with Galen showing compassion and saying, let him, let Zonda go and, and kill me. And by showing that compassion, now the humans have to prove that they're just as compassionate as the apes. And then they let both of them go. I wonder if that would have worked better. So we just proved something that you're a better writer than Rod Serling. <gasps> Who just said that? Who just said that? Don't say that. Mark, stop. <laughs> Don't say things like that. <laughs> So anyway, de- uh, after Zonda waves back at them and it seems like everything's kind of good, Dempsey joins Alan, Kovac, and Galen on the hillside and Verdon says to Dempsey, take a look at that journey, Mr. Dempsey. You might want to tell your great-grandchildren about it. Dempsey, we let some animals go free. Is it more than that? See, he doesn't even get it. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, you know something? Maybe he doesn't get it, because that's what he's saying. Is it more than that? That is strange. I did not get that when I read it the first time. But Kovac responds, it's a whole hell of a lot more than that. You've given us provisions, new food, water. He looks down towards the foot of the cliff at Zonda. You've given him a seed to carry with him. And you may just have started the planting of the biggest garden in the history of Earth. That's great. I love that. I love that cliffhanger. I love that so much. Yeah, it, it works really, really strongly. It works with where Zonda is. He's not completely changed, but the seeds have been planted there. I think it works really well. I think it ends on a very, very strong note until the next thing happens. And that's the apes head back towards Ape City, and Ursus tells his troops there will be no more killing today. Zonda looks back and waves at the humans, slow fade out. I, I don't understand. Ursus didn't go through some big journey. Yeah. Why isn't he attacking? I think he's seeing it through Zonda's eyes. What he's seeing, I don't know. But if Zonda's looking back and waving, then maybe everything is all right in the world. Maybe when we were up on the hilltop with Dempsey, Kovac, Allen, and Galen, Zonda was telling Ursus, you know, the Shakespeare quote. And maybe, <laughs> maybe Ursus got it. <laughs> So what you're saying is Ursus is smarter than all of us, even Dempsey. 
I wonder if it had been written by William Apespear, if we would have understood it. Of course we would (laughs) have. So I know we went through all of our thoughts during this whole thing. So, Mark, I'm I'm guessing you really like the script. I, I, I did really like the script a lot more than the last one. If it had been the first one I read of the Rod Serling scripts, would I have been a little bit more critical? Maybe, you know, maybe the fact that I hated the first one so much made this one look better. But there was so much going on here that 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 I really, really thought was smart. And with one or two more drafts, I think this could have been really good. I still wish Galen was a stronger character. I wish he was more of a main character. I feel like he's still being sidelined. I still wish the old Zeus would come back. But I like the addition of Zonda and think he had some real potential for future episodes if they were to have produced the Serling scripts. Yeah. I like the stronger action in the front. I'm sorry. I think it's stronger. And the ideas discussed in the dialogue I found very interesting. But they, it wasn't only interesting. It was thought-provoking. It had me questioning my own, you know, my own way of thinking. And then the conversation I just had with you about it was really, really interesting because, wait a minute, this makes sense. That makes sense. Where do you draw the fine line? And for a show like this to, you know, bring up questions like that, I, I feel like that's really interesting and really, really brave. And so all the dialogue that was really dull in episode one, none of the dialogue was boring here. So I definitely think this one is worth a read from all the ape fans over five years old. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? As a five-year-old, I would have hated this. As an adult, I can really see where they were going. And I love the direction where they were going. As a producer, I understand why they did the things that they did. So uh, I, I, I accept it. I accept this for, for what it is. And the ending just, just killed it for me. It kind of reminded me of the South Park episode where the underwear gnomes were stealing underwear. And phase one was to steal underwear. Phase three was profit. But they never got phase two. What was phase two? What connected one to the other? Right. Maybe just because I don't understand Shakespeare, that's, that's on me. What it comes down to to me when I look at how this this script is structured, the ideas that it's presenting, the thought process that it caused, you know, anything that causes you to think afterwards and causes you to maybe understand afterwards, that that's powerful. And I think that this was uh, this was pretty powerful. Some of the ideas that we ended up discussing that they had here. Oh, very, very much. I think episode one had none of that. And episode one was also the the whole structure of it and lack of canon and all that. It just bugged me. Well, episode one was just a springboard. So you, you can never really fault a pilot for what it did or did not have because it had to establish, reestablish characters in this case. But I can because I look at the pilot that we that we eventually got and that didn't have those kind of faults. That was a very strong pilot that really stands on its own. Go ahead, say it, Mark. You're right for one last time. (laughs) Mark, this is your last show. (laughs) You are right. You are so, so right. All right, Mark, since this is your last show, I thought we would include this next segment as an honor to you. This is a Planet of the Apes Muppet crossover. We all know that you you are a huge Muppet fan. And when I started to see these little crossovers here and there, I thought I'm going to start accumulating these and do it for Mark at some point in time. And this is the, is the point in time. So let's go over some of the times when the Muppets would cross over with Planet of the Apes. And we'll start with a show I had never heard of called The Muppet Show Sex and Violence. And the original working title for this was The Muppet Nonsense Show, which I liked even more. Mark, have you ever heard of The Muppet Show Sex and Violence? Yeah, I have a copy of it. I think it was included in the season one DVDs when they put them out. And I've actually seen it. It's not very good. And you wouldn't expect it to have sparked the Muppet Show because it's not very good. You would have figured they would have they would have passed on it. But we eventually got the Muppet Show, which is like just incredible in every in every way. But the Muppet Show, Sex and Violence, 
it was it was the pilot that they went around to try and pitch the show and yeah it's it, it's not so good and i'm not even sure why it's called sex and violence because the Muppet show is a kid show <laughs> now this this aired on abc on march the 19th 1975 i got to tell you i didn't till now i didn't even know it aired i thought it was just pitched i didn't know it aired yeah this was one of the two pilots produced for the muppet show this one and the other pilot called the muppets valentine show which aired in 1974 yeah, that's actually new news to me, too. I know the Muppets Valentine show, but I didn't know that that was considered a pilot. I'd never heard of any of these, so I got some YouTube watching to do tonight. <laughs> now, in this segment of Muppets Sex and Violence, a news anchor who strikes a resemblance to Gene Shalit, and we're going to pause right here while the younger viewers go and look up who Gene Shalit was. <laughs> he was pretty much a, a film critic with a mustache you could you could grab onto. This was a huge <laughs> handlebar mustache. And this Muppet, he reports on a new film from Colossal Pictures called Return to Beneath the Planet of the Pigs. Welcome to Films in Focus. And now for this week's film. Colossal Pictures has just released Return to Beneath the Planet of the Pigs the seventh in its series of pseudo-epics. The hero is an astronaut who visits a strange planet and finds himself in a curious situation. Well, who can bring some pickerel Like some ketchup. Here, human, 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 eat. I can't eat this junk. I'm a scientist from Earth. <gasps> Listen, it's speaking piggish. You're right. Let's take him to the great... Dr. Naga. Dr. Naga? Dr. Naga. Dr. He's Naga. He's brilliant. He'll drill a hole in the top of your head so we can look inside. While certain people might find this movie far-fetched, this reviewer found it to be totally believable, and I give it five points. I had never, ever heard of this show or these these crossovers. Now, there's a couple of more Planet of the Apes and Muppet crossovers. Are you ready for this? In the Sesame Street game, a computer game called Ernie's Adventures in Space, a bunch of grapes appear floating in space. One grape exclaims to another, Get your stems off me, you green seedless grape! It's time to get in the spaceship and explore outer space. Let's go! Get your stems off me. You green seedless grape. Uh, okay. <laughs> that is just so hilarious. And these next couple of ones are more current, where during an interview with MTV News, Kermit complimented Caesar's performance in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, saying, I thought we could meet up and talk shop. Turns out, he's only computer generated. Yeah, I think that's well. That was his dig to computer-generated characters. It would be a Muppet thing to do, so <laughs> to give that kind of dig. Hey, we're not computer-generated. We're still physical Muppets. You know, I went to the first annual Muppet Fest. I think it was called Muppet Fest. It was the only <laughs> annual one. They didn't actually ever do it again, but they showed for the first time this computer-generated. Uh, effects kind of thing that they were doing over at Henson and somebody asked if the Muppets would ever be computer generated and I don't remember who answered it it might have been Bill Beretta because uh, Brian Henson wasn't on this panel so I think it might have been Bill Beretta and he said the Muppets will never be computer generated because the Muppets have to be there they have to feel like they actually exist and you can't do that by computer generating them all right, now now the Muppets are going into social media here, where on January the 8th, 2016, Kermit, well, he tweeted this out. Uh, picture that, Kermit the Frog tweeting. And yeah, it wasn't a performer or anything like that. It was actually Kermit the freaking Frog. Why would you even doubt that? All right, so Kermit, he, he tweeted, In my downtime, while the Muppets are on hiatus, I've been working on some film pitches. So far, I have ten pages on Planet of the Frogs. And then Fozzie Bear responded with a suggestion for a tagline, which, which Kermit liked. And he, he tweeted, In space, no one can hear you croak. Okay, well, there he's mixing franchises with Planet of the Apes and Aliens. <laughs> 
Okay, I got one more. This is not really a Planet of the Apes crossover, more of a Star Wars crossover. Kermit then pitches his screenplay about a frog who rebels against an evil empire called The Frog Awakens. That's good stuff. That's just good stuff. (laughs) And I'm just glad that Kermit is on social media. And now I'm just waiting for him to go on TikTok. So, Mark, that was for you, the Muppet Planet of the Apes crossover. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You maniac! Shut up, you freak! You damn dirty ape! You know what they say. Human see, human do. And that day is upon you now! We would like to dedicate this episode of Talking Apes to the memory of Angela Rushmere. And like we said at the top of the show, we're going to read some of these heartfelt and touching messages left on our Talking Apes Facebook page. And if you haven't already, please go on over and leave a message since Angela's husband will be seeing these. And right now, I really think he needs to see how much Angela meant to all of us. So let's start off with Patrick Izzo and this message. He is talking right to Lee, her husband. Angela was a huge part of our community here at Talking Apes. And Angela's passing leaves a huge hole in our community and our hearts. Please accept our condolences and know that Angela touched a lot of hearts, not just here, but on a lot of Planet of the Apes pages. She will truly be missed. David Braun wrote, Terrible news. I always looked forward to her posts and photos I've never seen before. She was a true Apes fan and will be missed. I think Angela belongs on that Mount Rushmere of Apes fandom. All right, Stephen J. Dodd, he wrote so sad. She was a great contributor to the Apes pages. May she rest in peace now. Kevin E. Harris wrote, What? Sorry to hear that. May she rest in peace. To her husband, sorry for your loss. Paul Gleave wrote, Very sad to lose one of the Apes family. Dirk Wickenden, he wrote, I was late to the Apes Facebook party, though I've been a lifelong Apes fan, so I didn't know Angela, but she photoshopped a great photo for me when I asked if someone could put a saxophone in Urko's hands. Because he's a saxophonist himself, uh, Dirk. (laughs) That's funny. I don't remember seeing that photo. No, me neither. So we should ask Dirk to maybe post that up on our Talking Apes Facebook page, because I would like to see it. Yeah, good deal. I'll go through all of Angela's photos and put up some, like a best of. That'll be really nice. So Salo Adami wrote, My dear friend Lawgiver, I miss her and miss her generosity and affection. God bless you, my sweet Angela. God bless you and your family. Yeah, Salo had written the book, Talking Apes, and Angela was a, a, a great contributor to that. Now, this is a book not based on the podcast but (laughs) Planet of the Apes. Right. All right, Edward McLaughlin, he writes, You know, I must say, she and I only chatted a few times, but I remember thinking, but you're a girl. Boy, did I underestimate her. Yes, Edward, yes, you did. She was the biggest ape fan I ever knew. The Forbidden Zone has gained an angel. Oh. Susan Paul wrote, Shocked to hear about this. So sorry about her passing. She's up in heaven now. And George Bracebridge, he wrote, Oh my God, no. I spoke to her many times since I joined Ape City and all the other associated ape pages. So sorry to hear this. Rest in peace, Angela Rushmere. Now, Jason Rutledge wrote, Angela was a positive influence within our online ape community, and she has been and will be missed. Our good friend Anthony Palmas, he writes, Very sad to read of her loss. A major source of energy for all things ape. Rest in peace. You know, Rich, as we're reading this and we're reading one message after another, I'm really realizing how much she meant to the apes world because there's a lot here to read and a lot of people are going to miss her. Yeah, and these, these aren't even all of the messages. Yeah, this is... I'm, I'm really, really happy that the ape community is, is, getting behind her and saying goodbye the way they are. It's going to mean a lot to her husband. Okay, with that, we got more. So Roger J. Burton wrote, 
She was a good friend, and I loved all her posts. I will miss her, but she will live in my heart. Thanks for your friendship, Angela, wherever you are in the netherworld. Rob Hilliard, he writes, So very sorry to hear this final sad update. I did not know her or connect directly with her, but I sure enjoyed everything I saw that she had posted. Very informative and very passionate. Also, hearing the older podcast episodes, it was nice hearing her name as someone who really pumped up the page and the membership here, too. Thanks very much for the info and the very professional and classy post. And my condolences to you and everyone who knew her, virtually or otherwise. Thinking of and praying for her husband and friends and family. And then Bobby Horn wrote, just awful news. I didn't really know her, but she was very helpful to me on a few projects. Really sad to hear this about her. So once again, Ape fans, you've, you've got to go over to the Talking Apes page and read all of the comments and let Angela know what you thought of her. And if you haven't already, please go on over and leave a message since Angela's husband will be seeing these. And right now, I really think he needs to see how much Angela meant to all of us. That about does it for this episode of Talking Apes. We want to thank everyone for listening and coming back for each and every episode. And Mark, how did you feel for your last episode of Talking Apes? Well, I'm glad that we went off on a high note in the sense that I, you know, I liked what we read. If I had gone off last episode, I might not have felt so good because of how negative I was towards that script. But this was a good trip for me to go off on. I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss all the listeners. I, I, I'm really going to miss it. I really am uh, am glad that I went through this experience. I got more of an understanding on Planet of the Apes. I liked all the listener feedback. Um, I learned a lot about apes from the listeners, from you. It's been a good six years. I wish I could continue. I hope I can come back for some special episodes. But uh, unfortunately... You know, my life is starting to take over. But, uh, yeah, one final thank you to all the listeners for, you know, all the support they've given the show. Well, this started six years ago as a mini series of 14 episodes, and six years later, we're, we're still going. So I appreciate all that you have contributed to Talking Apes. And a special thank you to Rob Dellinger, who composed the theme to Talking Apes. Please check out Rob's band at alpharhythmkings.com. Now, for more vintage apes news and the stories, go over there to Simeon Scrolls at P-O-T-A dot Goatly, G-O-A-T-L-E-Y dot com and the Forbidden Zone dot net. Now, you can go over there to P-O-T-A dot Goatly dot com to see the scripts. He has a transcribed script and he also has the script pages. So go over there and download it so you can follow along with us. Now, if you haven't already, please join me and my sweetie wife, Sarah, on our Star Wars Disney podcast, Skywalking Through Neverland at skywalkingthroughneverland.com. Apple Podcasts or Stitcher reviews are greatly appreciated. And now stay tuned for bloopers and other fun conversational bits after the credits. So, until next time, this is Richard. And for the final time, this is Mark. Now, Mark, go ahead and take, take this away. Go ape. Read it like you were reading Ursus, with conviction. Go ape. All right. The record button has been pressed. There's no turning back. Well, if this Zaius turns out to be the same Zaius we see in the Rod Serling scripts, where he is more compassionate toward humans, well, it all ties in. You know, hold yeah, on. but he didn't sound more compassionate towards humans in this Jimmy Kimmel clip, so I'm a little worried. Well, I think he's very, very concerned for, for how we see each other right now. And some of us haven't shaven in a while. Or taken <laughs> yeah, a he shower. sounded like he was concerned about us. No, I think he's just, I think mainly, you know, maybe it's just all about me. He's just speaking <laughs> to me. Which was the meeting of Xanda, because he to me is... Zonda, Zonda. And we can count how many times I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> I think in my notes it's probably written as Zonda, Zondor, maybe even Zardoz a couple of places. Oh, more bloopers for the feed. 
<laughs> Hopefully people, you know, don't know what Zardoz is, actually. Uh, all the stuff that's going on, and Alan hitting uh, Zanda. Zonda. And- Zonda, Helen hitting Zonda with the rock. There's a lot going Stone. on. It's going to build up to something. All right, that ends Act Two. And before we go to Act Three, I need to use the bathroom. I'll be right back. I got a question for you, and you can put this in the bloopers if you want. Um, but uh, I'm really kind of curious about this. Did you just end that conversation relatively quick because you had to use the bathroom or because it was getting repetitive? Because you had said the same thing four times. <laughs> but now we can look forward to Muppets Now coming this summer on Disney+. Plus. I can't wait until Disney Plus decides to take this one down, too. Fade out. All right, so there you go after two and a half hours. Yeah, but a lot of that's cut outable, including the five minutes we took when we went to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Dr. Zayers from the Planet of the Apes, of course. My favorite podcast to listen to is Talking Apes, even though it's hosted by filthy humans. <laughs>